Hello, I'm Tim Harris. This is Julie Harris, and this is Real Estate Coaching Radio. That's right. So make sure that you hit the subscribe button so you won't miss any future episodes. Thanks again for popping by. Hit that like button, and don't forget to leave your comments and questions so we can get right back with you. We will. Thank you for continuing to make our podcast, Real Estate Coaching Radio, the number one listened to podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. And let us know what you think about this video. Leave your comments below. Thank you. I think Steve Jobs said something interesting. He said the customer is not always right, and, and they have to be, and right. they have to be told what they want. Well, it, I would agree with that generally, but more specifically, not everyone is your potential customer. Mm -hmm. And so, oftentimes, like I'll talk to people and I'll go like, you know, like who are your customers? And maybe their thing only has seven hundred customers. Mm -hmm. So it's like, why are you trying to get on the front page of the New York Times? You're going to reach a million people to sell seven hundred units. Like, just call seven hundred people, right? <laughs> like. <clears throat> And don't bother with it. So, so, so <laughs> did you guys catch what he just said? And relate that to agents who are spending all this money on marketing and branding and all that. Did you? I mean, yeah. Uh, did, did you catch the profoundity of that? I mean, like, look, you have fifty people in this audience. You didn't yeah. need to. You didn't need to reach ten million people mm -hmm. to, to fill fifty seats. You needed a community of, you know, probably a couple hundred people to match up schedule wise with the fifty people that you wanted to see here today. And wanted to come in to exactly. August and yeah. into Austin in July. Yeah, right. Those crazy people. <laughs> yes. Um, so so know who your customers are, know what you're trying to accomplish, and that allows you to 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 weigh impact uh, or weigh feedback properly. Cool. And who else? Good. Yes, Julie. Uh, first I wanted to tell you how much we admire your writing and really appreciate what you're doing you know, for the community, for the world, for everybody in this audience. And for us personally, we've really, you know, enjoyed what you've done and it's been meaningful to us. My question to you is, after writing so many great books already and having lots of projects going, what still motivates you? You could stop today. How do you, how do you uh, deal with your, you have to have a pull between maybe, I don't necessarily call it complacency, but you could stop now. You're already a fantastic writer. Versus, you know, how do you stay motivated? Yeah. At this point, I, I don't know if I, I don't know if I could stop like financially or uh, per like I don't know if I could I would probably just go out of my mind like if I didn't like part of this is just therapeutic for me so the process is very enjoyable, um, but uh, what I what what, get, what keeps what's wonderful about the profession of writing is that it's never as good on the page as it was in your head, so. Um, you're sort of starting from scratch with every project. Like, you, I have this idea, can I make it real? There's just a sort of a, a, just a fascinating challenge in that. So I'm, I'm definitely driven by that. Um, and th I think it is important to be driven by the challenge of what you're doing. Um, you know, to, to, to make a, a, a house where there wasn't a house or to make a, a, a business where there wasn't a business, or, or to make a relationship where there wasn't. If you can enjoy that process, then, then it doesn't matter if you're really successful or you're struggling, you're still driven by that. I think that's really important. Um, but what I'm trying to think about now, you know, I wrote a lot of books in a short amount of time. Now I'm trying to, now I'm trying to think about it more sustainably. It's not, it, it, I can't physically and mentally just doesn't, and, and then also understanding the market, it doesn't make sense for me to write a book a year for the rest of my life. I mean, that would be insane, right? Uh, and so I, now I'm, you know, now I'm seeing, now the challenge for me is that I'm working on a sequel to, to Ego, um, and I'm thinking, you know, can I, can I do it more slowly? Can I do it, you know, maybe it's, I, how can I do it better but differently than how I've done it in the past? And that's, that keeps me going as well. Do you need to be passionate to be successful? Uh, well, I, I say in the book that I think passion is a bad thing, um, and historically, passion was not considered a good thing. I mean, we, the Stoics talk about the passions, um, and the passions being sort of lust and greed and uh, excitement and things like that. I tend, like, my sort of flip answer is, like, would you want to hire someone who's passionate or someone who's competent? I would much rather hire a competent person. Uh, you. Um, it's just, I, I want someone who knows how to do what we're trying to do more than someone who just really likes it. <laughs> That's totally in conflict with what most people believe and we're being taught, which by the way, we agree with you. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, when I, with the clients that I work with, I tend to find that the, the passionate ones, they work harder, so that's great, but they end up doing a lot of, like, 
I, I dealt with a book recently with someone, and he's very passionate. He asked lots of smart questions. He was very invested. He worked very hard. But he was just sort of like just throwing everything at it all at the same time, and he didn't do the kind of prioritization that he needed. He didn't actually, like, um, it'd be like, I'm sending this out tomorrow, and, and I'd be like, whoa, whoa, I don't think you should do that. It's a bad idea. He'd be like, it already went out. You know, like, he, he was just sort of so, he'd get so excited, and he, would, he was so rushed about everything that he, although he worked really hard, he didn't work smart enough, and, and the book didn't work the way that it could have worked, I think. And so, um, I would, like, doing these things that we do is hard, and I think what you actually want is more sort of discipline and sort of strategic vision and deliberation. Um, because, again, like let's say it's writing a book or, or being financially independent. There's no shortage of people who are passionate about wanting those things, right? But there is a shortage of people who have got the chops to do it. Because passion's like a fleeting emotion. It's a fleeting emotion and it's also, it's not a rare emotion. Hmm. You know, like, like lots of people love football. Very few people have the body, have the mind, have the work ethic have the connections to be able to make it a career, right? And so um, I think by focusing on passion, you're focusing on the least scarce of all the variables. Hmm. Um, you know what I mean? I do, I think that's a great answer. Lovely lady in the back, were you, do you have any other complacency questions? Because that was a good question, by the way. I, I think that for many of the people in the room, these, these guys, it's not their first rodeo. Yeah. Yeah. And so at some point when these guys have things paid off for the most part, they have a pretty great lifestyle, then the struggle can become continuing to be motivated. And, and so then the passion conversation comes up. Maybe I've lost some of my passion for you. Yeah. You know, that's kind of where I was driving at. So we have, we have to repeat her question because we didn't have her on mic. Oh, sure. so, so the essence of it basically was how do you keep your how, the battle between staying motivated and complacency? And that's something all of us deal with, right? Yeah. And so, can't hear you. It's easy when you have bills to pay and yeah. you, know, you got to get a, a down payment for your house. You want to pay your car off. Fear. And then all that is done. Yeah. And you know that you don't necessarily need that 40 foot jet boat, okay? And you've made the decision maybe you're not going to make that a priority. But there's some place in between. Like, how do you settle in on maybe. Can, can you tell this is a conversation we have in our marriage? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, look, I. Can I, you see where this is coming from? I am. Uh, I this is counseling. Because I have the, the same conversation that I think about yeah. a lot. So, uh, and to go to your earlier question about me and writing, what I think about is, okay, I want to do this sustainably over a long period of time. Like in, in uh, I, I like to run. And so in a weird way, like in a, in a competitive race, uh, I guess this also goes to passion, it's not like who starts out the fastest and then just doesn't fall off. It's about discipline. It's about knowing where to put the energy um, to be able to get all the way to the end and then have a little bit left over at the, you know. And so uh, when I, you know, I had this sort of great burst of energy and now I'm thinking, look, I want to continue doing this until, you know, you can keep writing until the day that you die. Um, so I have to conserve some of that energy and I have to direct it properly. And so I think part, part of the way you don't become complacent is you don't just continue at the same pace forever. You've got to be able to sort of space out how you want to do this. And so um, having, having a bit of a plan for like where you see this going. So again, you know, writing a book a year, that doesn't, you can't do that for 20 years, that's insane. So I, I have to start spreading them out and, and thinking about it that way. And so, so now that I'm not complacent because I'm saying I'm slowing down, but I'm working differently. Hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm now gonna try to get better in this way like slowing down, I have more things to think about than when I was going quickly, that wasn't a concern. So, so trying to change it up that way, or I'm gonna to try to do this thing that I've never done before. I think one of the ways you become, you, you become less complacent is by um, one, sort of regulating your energy, but then also finding little things to focus on or improve in the way that a golfer might say, you know, this year I'm working on my, my, my short game, 
or you know, putting is where I could get better. You know, just picking little things to, to get better at, and that 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 would be one way to, to focus on it. And then again, you're not sort of just trying to do everything at the. You know, that that's that's where you get burnout, out. I think. Uh, I have a quick statement and then a question. So please never get complacent because you, you. too, Tim and Julie, please don't because you guys lead and you teach and you give us such great examples. So it's the next Thank generation. You of not only realtors, but citizens. Um, but directly for you, Ryan, your book was so pivotal that I've read it, I've listened to it on tape constantly. And I have two boys. Okay. And uh, one of my boys was trying to make some money. And I said, okay, if you listen to this book and we have a conversation after every chapter, I will give you $300. Wow, okay. No, right? Good yeah. deal. He did not do it. Okay. So when I think about your book and I think about your philosophies that are timeless and all of the lessons, and I can't remember the term in the one chapter, was it a dociant? Was it an intern? The, yeah. Okay. So when I think about the next generation coming up with social media and everything that's coming against them, how do we teach and can you address in your next book on ego something that's more specific to as they come up in the world and to keep their egos in check and to really be that intern and learn and support so that they can be great down the road. I, I do I do think that's the that's that's the big issue right now. It's like when you pull up Instagram or YouTube or whatever, it's all these people who are sort of accidentally successful. Like I started an account and then I had a million followers. That's how you do it. And uh, obviously those are the sort of sexy fun examples and um, but not how it works in real life. Those might be the people you hear about but you don't that the story of the person who you know had their YouTube channel for eight years before it started working, you know, that's that's less interesting. And so, uh, I think part of what you've got to teach is like the the pro like showing the what how it actually works behind the scenes. I mean, one of the things that uh, I think was hard for me when I was younger is that I didn't know anyone that none of my parents' friends were writers, right? None of my none of my parents' friends were successful in any way besides having a job and working hard at that job until they retired, right? Um, but then, uh, because I, I had some sort of lucky chance encounters and I sent some emails, you know, I started meeting people who, who did what I do. And that was really helpful to me because then I saw that, oh, it's just, it's just a job, like any other job, right? Like it's like, oh, this person, they have an idea and then they work on that idea every day for a long period of time and then out the other side comes a book. And so I think showing people how the process actually works is both, both sort of takes some of the sort of mystique out of it, which is good, but then it also shows them like, oh, these people are just human beings. You know, I would say like, you know, there, there's, there's weird stats how like um, uh, the children of professional athletes are disproportionately um, uh, represented in professional sports. I think a chunk of that is is genetics, but I would argue that a big chunk of it is like, like my dad was in the NFL, I could be in the NFL, right? Like it, it loses like the craziness of it. And so I think obviously everyone in this room, your children has an advantage in that like you did it, but also I would try to expose them to other, because you know, you don't take your parents as seriously as you should, show them other people who have done this and sort of break down the, the you know, this isn't a get-rich-quick scheme. It's a process, it's a skill, and it's like anything else. Before I next, uh, next question, wait for the mic, please. That's my fault. Sorry, Tom. So, she, smart lady over, the, over here. Tom's going to get a workout now. <laughs> I've done, they, do, they have this new thing now. It's like a microphone. It's like a square, and you can I know. throw it. Oh, um, really? Yeah, yeah. Ventura, yeah. add that to the list. <laughs> That's awesome. Actually, I want to elaborate on the question that came previously okay. because that was actually in my mind. And one of the things that I've been thinking about is books like what you're writing mm -hmm. are almost now in a different stratosphere from what I find young people are even interested in. Um, they have so many other things coming at them, social media, etc. And the idea of actually sitting down and reading a book, whether sure. it's on a tablet or a book, just is too, demands too much attention or too much focus. What do you see as far as the future for writers like yourself 
Well, in a, in a way, I think that's what makes makes books so important and so special is that it it's not on a screen. Ideally, it's it's immersive. You know, like you flip through a newspaper, you pour over the pages of a book. I think that sort of quiet, meditative experience is is more important than ever right now. Um, yeah. Okay. You okay. Do you, do you see a time where only the elite would be the ones reading these types of books because they're teaching their children to do these things, for yeah. example, and other classes of people that are not in the elite who are not doing these things, their children will eventually fall away from that? I guess. I mean, the truth is uh, smart people have always been the only people that, write, that read. Do you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> and, and sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. But yeah, I, I, do, I do think that... An author would say that. <laughs> as, as it's been easier to spend, you know, you're, let's say you used to get on a plane and there was nothing to do but read, it was easier to read. So I, I think that's definitely a problem. And, and sort of giving kids uh, or your employees or whatever space and carving it out and sort of making it a pro I think is a great skill to give them. Although I, I'm really encouraged by like audiobooks and podcasts right now. Um, you know, it's something you can do while you do something else. Um, I think there are people that are discovering from podcasts and audiobooks that, um, you know, previously they thought they didn't like books because they don't like reading. Um, but now that what a book is is changing and expanding, and maybe those people weren't served by, you know, a 900 page biography of someone before, but they could listen to a one hour podcast with the author where. They give you know enough of the the broad strokes of it that now they are willing to try a book. So I think the technology is double. It, there's a double edged uh, sword there. It, it's it's good in some ways. It's bad in other ways. But um, at the end of the day, yeah, you, it's the people that make the time to do it and carve out the space that are going to benefit from it. If you have a question, raise your hand. Wait for the mic. You know, it's interesting. I heard someone recently say. Um, that uh, podcasts are going to are bigger the biggest thing since the Gutenberg Press. Yeah, I I, I, I would totally agree with that. I mean, it's now incredible. Like you, you just said that studio and you have to broadcast over the airways for people to hear something. And now you know you can yeah right you can just record on a microphone and blast it out to millions of people. And it's they, amazing. They can listen to it. What like. I, as a professional, like people go, how do you read so much? And it's like, well, I get paid to read books. That's my job. Um, not everyone is so lucky. Um, I don't have a commute, but um, so so I don't have. I never had that hour of dead time, you know, when I went from here to, to to there in the morning. And so now those people can listen to an audio book when they're driving or a podcast, and and I think that's really exciting. It is amazing because yeah. more people are. That's the the magic of podcasts, and they look yeah. at the. The, it, it's incredible. I mean, look at how many, what Joe Rogan does, like five a week. Yeah, and, and then he, three it, or four hours, it's crazy. And three or four hours, just long-form conversations, and you look at how many downloads he gets and how many views he gets on YouTube. It, it's in a week, he's getting more people consuming his information than the best-selling books. It's amazing. Totally. Yeah, no, I think it's great. Yeah, that's incredible. Any other questions, guys? Oh, oh wait for the mic. He's got it. Oh, good. Uh, hi, Ryan. Hi. Uh, other than uh, authors, are there any other artists Um, in terms of artists, that's a good question. I was um, thinking more directors, actually. Like like a movie director? Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm not like a huge I'm not like a huge movie person, but I, I it is interesting. You know, we live in this. You know, it, also with podcasts, there's you know Netflix and Amazon. There's so much great content being created in all these different mediums. I can, I try not to be a snob about like reading is the only way to learn. You could learn something from an episode of Mad Men or Breaking Bad, or you can watch doc. I mean, I love the sort of research. We're, we're probably in a golden age right now of documentaries. Uh, these are these are all ways to learn, um, and, and I think just people should take advantage of it. I don't, I don't have like anyone in me like this person I'm a huge fan of, but um, I, I just try to consume as much as I can in as many different areas as I can um, and try to learn as much as I can. Any other questions? We kept Ryan way over. Yeah, so um, you mentioned about social media. 
Yeah. Right. Someone like myself who had to really adapt to social media and I'm older. But I got a lot of friends who, you know, who's young who taught me how to utilize it. So do you consider someone posting on social media in the morning frequently or you know, um, as, as much as they can as ego with this business strategic? Well, I mean, clearly I, I have to use all the platforms in my own career it's where it's where the audience is. So I think that's part of it, but it's it's also like I try to, for instance, automate my stuff as much as possible. So um, I try to check it as rarely as possible. Um, when I do catch, when I do catch, when I do check it, I notice how unhappy it makes me, and that's usually a sign I should not be doing it right. Um, so I think you, you've got to know how to play the game. You've got to play it to some advantage, um, and then, uh, but but also, I, I guess I would be very. I try to try to monitor and check, like like we were talking about Elon Musk. It's like clearly he can't not do it, right? And that's a bad sign. Like that he can't stop himself from fighting with random people on the internet. Given all, that's a really bad sign. And so maybe that's the reason he developed the automated car because he maybe, must have been yeah, the worst, be to, crazy, yeah. flicking people off when he was driving. Now he just hits a button. He can. Well, I mean, what what uh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, no. That I, makes I, total I, sense. I, I, think, I, think, I, think, I think you're totally, I think you're totally right. We're onto something. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> look, if, 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 if you feel that sort of compulsion or pull, like you have to do it, that's probably a sign there's some, some ego. You said it. something I don't know if Master heard you say. You said you were being introspective about how something was making you feel, yeah. and that's a way of keeping the ego in check, too. So yeah. that little subtle point, I hope you guys picked that up. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, for instance, I've de I, I deleted all the social media apps from my phone. So I can check them when I'm on my computer, when I'm working, but I'm not, uh, you know, just, oh, did someone tweet about me? Did someone tweet about me? You know, like, I, that, that sort of just dead time is something I try to avoid. Great. Hey, thanks, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hello, thank you for having watched this video. Please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's right, and don't forget to hit that like button, leave your comments and questions below, and we will get right back with you. Thank you for watching this video, and remember to watch the next one. You're gonna love that one.